Hello, my name is Per Thorsen. I work as a teacher in communication at Western Norway University of Applied Sciences. Today we are going to look at the maximum channel capacity formula. It's Shannon's formula. It's derived using geometry in this case. It, the formula is the capacity or the maximum capacity of a channel is given by the bandwidth of the channel, logarithm to two of one plus the signal to noise for the channel and it gives the capacity in bits per second. Uh, this derivation I found in the book by Pierce called an introduction to information theory. It was first published in 1960 and the second edition came in 1980. This book is extremely good and the first time I read it I forgot to get off the bus. Before Shen, we had the Newquist and Hartley formula that says that the number of bits per second in a channel was given by the number of messages multiplied by the number of messages per second that was sent. Um, when we take the two logarithm to the number of messages, we get the number of bits in each message. If we, for instance, have 16 messages, the, the, the log two of 16 is four. That means we have four bits per message. The problem is that if we have a lot of messages and limited number of uh, limited power, uh, the messages will be susceptible to noise. And that is what uh, Shannon saw and also made a formula for. We have to have some signal and noise prerequisites. Uh, the signals and the noise have to be stationary and agonic, which they usually are. That they are stationary means that if we take a time slice here in this same time slice here, it contains the same energy on an average, same energy. And also if we take a lot of ensembles down here and take the voltages for the signals here at each ensemble member. This is the same as taking a lot of uh, sorry, voltages along the time series here. The, the same variation in voltages along ensemble and time axis. That is the same as saying that it's ergodic. They have the same energy content, whether you go down this way or you go down here. And then we are going to look at the volume of an unball because we need that in the geometrical derivation of Shannon's formula. And if we look at the two ball and look at the volume ratios between uh, this one here having a radius of one and this red one having a radius of a half, this is the area of the innermost and this is the area of the outermost. And we see that the ratio is one fourth. If we go to three dimensions, we see we have the volume of the inner ball divided by the volume of the outer ball. And you see that the ratios is one eight. Most of the volume is in the outer part of the ball. And we go to N dimension using the inner ball with R or the radius of half and the outer ball, the radius of one, it's two minus N. So most of the volume will be close to the surface here. And if we take the inner ball with R equal 0 0.99 and up in N, which is an N ball, we see that it goes like null Point, null point 0.99 in N. And the inner ball parts of the total volume will then be with R equal to 0 0.99. Here we see the part of the volume, here we see N, and we see as N grows, the part of the volume of the inner ball goes to zero. So all the volume will be close to the surface of an N ball. So what is this? This is the gamma function. 
If you are not familiar with this, I will just show you a slide or two about the gamma function. Here you see how it looks. Here is the x axis, here is the y axis, and here is the gamma function. You see it goes like this here and for real values, or oh, sorry, for positive values and here for negative values. Um, for integers, the gamma function is defined as n minus one faculty and it's recursive. So you can find uh, gamma n plus one as n multiplied by gamma n. And it's a well-known fact that gamma for a half is square root of p and then gamma for one half plus one will be one half square p using this recursive formula. So here we have drawn the, the values of the gamma function for integers and half integers. And you see the curve goes something like that. We can also stretch this gamma function out in a complex plane, but we will not look into this anymore because we are in fact not using the gamma function or because we divide these volumes on each other. So the, this just disappears anyway. Okay, and now we are going to calculate the energy. We see the voltages, voltage on this axis and the time on this axis. And here we have a signal. The energy of that part of the signal is the same as the energy of that part of the signal. And we are trying to calculate the energy of this part of the signal. We start by doing one measurement here. We are sampling this sample. The energy is the square of the voltage of this sample. And since it's negative, it's pointing in this directing here, the V1 direction. So then this is the square root of the energy. And here we are measuring this and this, and the energy is the square of the first voltage plus the square of the second voltage. And here is the square root of, of the energy too. And if we go to three dimensions, we get another measurement here. We need to have a single space with the three dimensions. And here V1, V2, and V3. They are both positive V2 and V3, so they are going in the positive direction. And then the square root of E2 is pointing in this direction. And then we go to another dimension, V4. And then we have four dimensions here. We have the square of V1, V2, V3, and V4. And the square root of that is this blue arrow here. The energy, squared of the energy, square root of the energy. And if we take a lot of measurements like this, we got the energy as the square of V1, V2, V3, V4 to Vn. And here we have an n ball. And on the surface of done, that n ball, we have the square root of E1 and the square root of E2. And the dimension is the number of samples. The dimension here, n, is the number of samples we are taking here. So the number of samples is the uh, how many frequency of the samples and the time we have measured. And that is two times the Nyquist frequency multiplied by the time, which is two times the bandwidth multiplied with time. So that is the dim dimension of our ball. And the E2, that is energy due to the signal and energy due to the noise. And if we write this as B T multiplied by S plus N, we have the signal power and the noise power. And here we see the, for instance, and signal here going from here to somewhere like there. And then we have a noise ball here, with, which is also an end ball. 
that is with with a signal here in the middle or the square root of the energy of the signal. So this is the voltage of the signal in the middle here. Okay, so now the question is, how many of these noise balls can we put in the signal to plus noise ball? Here is the signal plus noise ball. This ball is defined by all these energies measured in this time slots that was the same and defined this ball. And the noise ball was defined here. So how many of these small balls can be put into this big ball? Well, then we ha just have to divide the volumes. Here is the, the volume of the signals plus noise ball divided by the noise ball. And here we see the dimension of the ball is 2bt. In the middle of all these noise balls, there is a possible signal level. So how many levels measured in bits? Well, then we have BT log two, one plus SON. We have just taken the square, which gives us a half when we take the two logarithm plus two BT. So then we have BT. And then we, if we look at capacity per unit time, we divide here by T for the time. And then we get C is equal to B log two, to one plus S over N. And what is this? Is Shannon's formula. So if we look at it uh, and it, like this, we can see here, we, if we have two levels, we can think of here is the ball, which is noise and signal ball. So the Length here is S plus N squared. The length of the noise ball is the noise squared. This, we have two levels. Here we have four levels. So then we have four possible, zero, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, one. And then we can have eight levels and 16 levels by just putting more and more balls into this n-dimensional ball. And we see as the, the number of balls goes up, the distance between the noise, which is very close to the surface here on the red ball, and the signal level here in the middle will be smaller and smaller. So it will be more vulnerable to, to noise the more signal levels you have. And also uh, an interesting observation is that the higher the capacity, the more the signal resembles to noise. Because here, we can get the signal here at one instance, here at another instance, here at a third instance, and so on and so forth. And for an observer that maybe looked just like noise, but if an observer see here in just two levels, they see just this one and this one and this one and this one, it doesn't look like noise, it looks like a signal. So the best thing we can do with a signal is to make it look like noise. Okay, let's go and look at an R set, which is no return to zero. That is typically a, a, a form of communication where you are using a positive voltage for one and a negative voltage for zero. And we can look at the number of bits per second, this ratio R here. And the R is given by Nyquist and Harley as the little r, which is the number of messages per second, logarithm to the two, because M is two. So we have plus one, or now sorry, plus voltage and minus voltage. That means two levels. And that equals to one if we choose to make the symbol rate equal to one symbol per second. In Shannon's limit, then you have at R is equal to C. Then C over B will be logarithm 
to two or one plus s over n. So what is the minimum s over n for an R set? Well, it's one plus s over n equals to two. That means that s over n must be equal to one. And taking the logarithm, it says that the minimum s over n is zero dB. So here, Shannon's formula is turned around a little bit. And here we have the energy per bit divided by the noise power per hertz. And you see there, here is this curve here. The blue one here, it says that when C is equal to R or R is equal to C, then we are sending with a maximum capacity to be here when R is larger than C, that is impossible. And so we are always on this end. And here you see for 125 QM, it can be shown that the error rate for 128 QM follows this curve here, where is EB divided by N0 on this axis and the error rate on this axis. So for error rate of one to the minus eight, you see it's roughly about 23 dBs. So it's somewhere here, 23 dBs. It gives you seven bits per symbol. So, it, but it's not optimal. You see that in order to get to the optimal where R C is equal to R, you have a, a way to go. And the only way to go to this, go along this way is to have some kind of coding. Because if you have some kind of coding, this one here would bend much more like this so that you will come closer to this one. And here you see also for different, here is for 64 QM, here's for 16 QM, and here you see for QPSK and NR set. And we saw that for NR set, this, uh, let's go here and see for NR set, it was zero dB. Which, and here you see it's zero dB EB over NO here. But in practice, what we get is something like 12 here. This is based on the formulas for calculating the error rate. So in order to get from here down here, we need some kind of coding to, for that signal. Okay, this was an introduction to the maximum channel capacity theorem by Shannon and I've derided using geometry, which I think is a very nice way of doing it. Thank you very much for your attention.